Hello everyone, uh, welcome to my Booker Prize review of Emily Friedland's History of Wolves. Um, this is because the shortlist has now been announced. I can say that this is a Booker shortlist uh, review. Um, and I will tell you a little bit at the end about my views on this making the shortlist um, above various other books um, uh, which were on the long list. So uh, before I get into that, here's a little bit about what this book is actually about. So it is a coming of age story uh, about a girl who is, depending on who you believe, called either Linda or Madeline, Maddie. Um, and it's about her life growing up in a dying commune or the remnants of a commune in rural Minnesota. And during her teens, she gets caught up in the death of a child and the subsequent manslaughter case. Um, and the novel is told from the point of view of Linda Stroke Maddie in her 20s, looking back on that period of life and looking back more generally on her childhood and what that experience was like. So it's a sort of a story of a, of a broken woman looking back on a rather odd childhood in rural Minnesota. It is about, it, it's, a, it's a book of many themes um, and these all play out sort of simultaneously in the way that the story is told. So in part it is, it is this coming of age story about Linda or Maddie uh, growing up. It's also about life in small town Minnesota, so uh, the harshness of the winters, the beauty of the summers, the experience of spending a lot of time in woodland, the experience of canoeing across the lakes, of uh, splitting logs, of looking after dogs, of having a whole range of responsibilities to do with living in this very isolated place. Um, it is also a novel about uh, parenting, so both the way that uh, Linda is parented by the two adults who remained in the commune who may or may not be her biological parents. It's also about the parenting of a toddler called Paul um, by um, Patra and Leo who are Christian scientists and who bring Paul up in a slightly odd way. Um, it is about nature, it's about living in a way which is very isolated from uh, what most of us would consider to be normality. Um, it is about power struggles within relationships, so both between Linda's parents, but also, and almost more importantly, between Patra and Leo, this other couple whom, whom uh, Linda gets to know, uh, and I suspect probably falls in love with Patra, partly as a mother figure, partly as a, um, a sort of a peer, uh, because Linda is very, a very lonely, isolated child and teenager. Um, it's also about uh, sort of paedophilia and what paedophilia actually is. So there's an aspect of uh, teenage girls seducing their male teachers, um, but also those male teachers being convicted for paedophilia entirely separately from that. And the relationship between Leo and Patra is also that of a professor who marries his uh student who is many years younger. So there's an aspect of age inappropriate relationships and the point at which that fades or so that shades into into paedophilia as well. So there's a lot going on in terms of the the themes that this novel touches on and the Christian science element is also important in terms of ways of seeing the world. Um, there's, there's, there are weird shades of religion both in the initial commune that Linda grows up in but also then in her mother's uh, sort of born again Christian attempts to escape what we suspect might have been some evil in that commune, plus the Christian science of Paul's parents, Patra and Leo, which then becomes the, the centre of the manslaughter case later on. So there's a lot going on in terms of themes. Um, there's also a lot going on in terms of structure in this book. So the narrator... Linda is in her mid to late 20s, we suspect, I think, as the novel is being told. So it partly centres on the way her life is happening at that stage. But the core of the story in terms of this manslaughter case 
is in Linda's teens. And then we also get bits that go back to her own early childhood, both before the commune broke up, so before sort of age seven or so, um, and also immediately after the commune broke up when Linda has had her childhood friends removed and is suddenly alone with these two adults who may or may not be her uh, biological parents. And the novel flits between those different points of view. It's always very easy to tell which one of those periods of time we're in, um, but there is a constant movement between them, which makes it structurally quite complex. Um, now, it's, as I say, there is a lot going on in this novel. Um, I think we probably have to judge it based on what it claims to be about. And what it claims to be about is an enormous, um, very, very ambitious theme. So it claims to be about human evil, or the, the, the mystery of human evil. Um, this, is, this is why I think that is what it claims to be about. So here is a passage uh, from one uh, from fairly late in the in the novel. So this is Linda telling her her flatmate Anne when they're both in their in their twenties a little bit about her traumatic childhood, which she has so far refused to tell people about. At some point that year, maybe that night, maybe a few weeks later, I ended up telling Anne about Loose River. I told her about the competing nativity scenes at Christmas the Lutheran sandbag Jesus and the Catholic's ice one. I told her about the gym roof that collapsed in eighth grade and about Mr Adler, who loved the Russian monarchs more than anything, even America. I may even have told Anne about my parents eventually and about beautiful Lily, Lily who left us to have her baby, but I never said a thing about Patra and Paul and I never told her what I really thought about Christian science, which is that from what I know, from what little I know, it offers one of the best accounts of the origin of human evil. This is where it comes from, Anne, I think now. That's the story I'm trying to tell here. So that, I think, is the, is the statement of what Friedland wants this novel to be about, the sort of the mystery of the origins of human evil and, where, and the role that Christian science plays within that. And that's a, an enormous theme to take on and to take on explicitly. So my question really, as I read this novel was, to what extent does it succeed? If that's the stated aim, is this actually a novel about the origins of human evil? And I think, I think it addresses that question interestingly, and for me overall it didn't really pull it off. But here are some of the ways in which it addresses that question. So if we think about the sources of evil in the novel, there are three big ones I think. One is this question of paedophilia, uh, which in most people's minds would be very firmly classified within evil. Um, one is the question about the damage that parents do to their children inadvertently while trying to treat them well, which is a more subtle um, approach to their question. And then the third one is this question of um, Christian science not providing traditional medical care to a toddler who is extremely ill and who dies as a result of that, which is sort of at the core of the novel. And that's not a spoiler telling you that. So that's, that's made clear early in the novel. We're told about Paul's death early in the novel. Um, and then the rest of the novel is sort of unravelling the events that lead up to that. But anyway, let's take those, let's take those three in turn. So the paedophilia one, I think, is interesting. It's so easy to take the tabloid newspaper approach here and say, this is intrinsically an evil thing. It's absolutely the adult's fault, um, and and there's there's no there's no question about it. And the novel does complicate this a little bit. So um, Mr. Grierson uh, is initially seduced by Linda. So they are working together on a school project. There's not particularly any suspicion of or any suggestion of anything wrong on his part, and yet she reaches out. Um, she kisses him, she tries to seduce him. So there's complexity there. There's a second complexity, which is that he is separately accused by another girl in the class of seducing her and making her pregnant. Um, and there is a court case that comes up as a result of this. It later turns out that he has done nothing of the sort and that she has made this up 
in order to avoid having to marry the boy who actually did make her pregnant. So by claiming that it was her teacher's fault, she gets out of that, she gets to have the child and she gets to have a life which is not um, tied with the teenage boy who actually made her pregnant. So there's a suggestion here that paedophilia is, um, is an accusation that is made, but actually it's the, in this case, it is the fault of the teenage girls, not the fault of the teacher. That's part of it. The other half of what's going on is that actually he is a paedophile. So it is, it's, he has a load of papers discovered in his flat, which are pictures of underage children having sex or people having sex with underage children. Um, and therefore he does have a, a conviction for paedophilia and he has to go and live in another state and he is hounded by newspapers and hounded on social media for his behavior. So it's sort of playing off both. He both is and is not a paedophile. It both is and is not his fault. And he remains the teacher that uh, Linda is most grateful for, um, given that he gave her an interest in doing this project on the history of wolves, which is much less relevant to the book than the title would suggest. Um, and he is the teacher that she writes to in her 20s, to to maintain a, a connection with and he writes back extremely kindly and with great wisdom about what it is like to uh have a wider view of nature than she is able to have so there, there's a there's a complexity there in the way that's um where that works i've just kicked my tripod so that was what the shudder was um that's piece one Piece two then is this question of parenting. And this is an interesting one again. Uh, so she is growing up in a commune. The commune was designed to give a wider, more genuine view of the world than the adults had when they were growing up. Um, and yet it turns into, for Linda, a world in which she is isolated from other children. She is dirt poor and suffers at school because of that. There's a lot about um, uh, how old and unsuitable her clothing is, how she's mocked at school, the tasks that she has to do at, at home in order to continue this, this supposedly idyllic lifestyle, which is actually um, practically extremely brutal. So there's something playing off there about um, the choices that parents make and the effects that that has. And that then feeds into this third theme, which is probably the most complex of them all, which is that you have these Christian science parents, Leo and Patra, um, who, whose religious belief means that they are unable to get traditional medical care for their son, Paul, when he falls ill and he suffers uh, cerebral edema and dies of that. And there is then a court case which Linda is implicated in um, to do with the extent to which they knew that he was seriously ill and neglected him versus the extent to which they were truly treating him well as as parents. So there's a whole range of themes about is this is this evil or is this inadvertent genuine mistakes playing out through the novel. Um, that said, I didn't care. And this is I think is the problem. So if you have a book about the the origins of human evil, you have paedophilia, you have dying children, you have childhood neglect in a number of different ways. Um, there has to be some sort of emotional response from the reader. And it felt to me as though Friedland was laying out all of these themes, was laying out all of these complexities. For chapters, this child is lying, this toddler is lying, dying on a bed, and people are um, stepping around him, not looking after him. And there should surely be an emotional pull as that takes place. And I just, I didn't care. So in the sense that the origin of evil has to be an emotive topic, um, I didn't believe in it. And I think that's partly because the novel overall is quite muddled. So it has all of these different structures going on. It has all of these different themes going on. There is a, a complicated cast of, of characters and none of it really has, none of it really comes to the fore. There's a constant shifting between different aspects of the novel and I think that weakens it. I think this would have been a stronger novel if it had concentrated more on the court case with everything else as um, as supporting features or on Linda's uh, childhood 
without the court case being part of the novel at all, um, and with the aspects of the school and the paedophilia being a supporting theme to that, it feels as though there are multiple themes being carried out that are all equally important and which are all then um, weakened by the fact that none of them is allowed to to take the take the whole weight of the novel. Um, my other objection really to this book, or my other difficulty with it, was that the writing sort of lacks flair. And I do need to talk, I do need to do a video at some point, at some stage, which is about what I what I think about good writing. Because this is this is not badly written. Um, but it reads as though it's the output of a creative writing class in which she has been told how to write. Um, and it just that never really had any any life to it. I never particularly believed in the, I believed in the setting. Uh, so I believed in the cold of Minnesota, I believed in the woods, but I never quite believed in any of the characters. And that in turn then cut my emotional response to them, which meant that the themes didn't have the weight that they should. So in, in that sense, I think the writing needed to be at the heart of this. Um, and and for me, it really it really couldn't quite take the weight that is being placed on it. So my sense on this overall is that it's it's a very it's a very ambitious novel. It's a very uh, weighty novel in terms of its themes, but it doesn't really manage to to make the most of those. And I ended up comparing it to the to the other coming of age novels that were on the book a long list. So four three two one is a coming of age novel in its four different ways. Swing time is also a coming of age novel, and swing time did not make the short list. And as I compared. Uh, history of wolves with swing time it is it's just a i mean my video of swing time is yet to come but history of wolves is a a less successful novel it's a less believable novel it doesn't live up to it the way it builds itself as a novel about the origins of human evil a big theme i will say again um it doesn't really quite um stand up to that for me i don't i don't understand why anyone would choose this over swing time um for the Booker shortlist. So yes, that's my view. Uh, it's it's interesting, you should read it. If any of these topics interest you, you should read it. But it did feel a little bit like writing by numbers. Let's have the theme, let's complicate the theme, let's have, have two different ways of exploring the same theme. It's unclear what is evil and what is good. That is, after all, the nature of human evil. It felt a little bit sort of write by numbers, like that. Uh, you may disagree. Tell me what you think.